As I, sorry, as I say to my kids, you um, you always have to try and be your best. You don't have to be your you don't have to be the best. The best is a bonus, but to try and be your best, like that's what counts. So whatever you do, just make it count. Ula lele azisha sports podcast oi tule lwa ipepa ndaba the witness. Kule podcast ogle tela izi ndaba zeze mzala zi shisayo. Spinda stokla nosa zwayo. Oba zi yoguyo indi meze mzala. Nga badzala ipola le zinyawe rugby cricket. Noma aba kichimayo. Noma badzali netball. Bonke sobe skluma nabula. Iyo na agefuti podcast leo zo pindu tole gui izi ndaba zi shisayo ze nzegayo. Indi menize mzala. Hello, it is Friday again and that means we have another entertaining episode of Azisha Sports Run brought to you by The Witness newspaper. There is no APSA Premiership football this weekend and Maritzburg United are not in action, but soccer lovers will still be keen to see which sides uh, go through to the semi-finals of the Netbank Cup. Real Kings are the only KZN side still running in the cup competition and tonight they will host Bidvest West at the Shuka Ray Tulu Stadium in Deben where the kickoff is set for 8 p.m. We all know that Real Kings are campaigning in the Glad Africa Championship or the National First Division as you know it. Uh, and tomorrow, Baroka FC will host Black Leopards in the Limpompo Derby which will kick off at 3 p.m. and Sundowns will travel to Highlands Park three hours later. Another NFD side, TS Sporting from Mpumalanga province will welcome Bloemfontein Celtic at Kanyamazane Stadium and the kickoff will be uh, at 3 p.m. on Sunday. Super Rugby action is on this weekend again, but the game that will draw a lot of attention will be the fixture between the Sharks and the Stormers, which will take place at the Kings Park in Devon. That is a South African derby and a top-of-the-table clash. Sharks coach Sean Everett made no changes to his team that defeated the Jaguars last weekend and will be hoping to beat the Stormers who are coming from a bye. In this episode number five, the Witness Sports editor Ukal Peters had a sit-down with the Peter Maritzberg power couple and enduro athletes Martin and Ginny Dreyer. They recently teamed up to win the 2020 Juzi Kenu Marathon Mixed K2 Race Edition. Please take a moment to enjoy this interview and hear what they will be up to in the near future. Welcome to this uh, latest edition of the Witness uh, Sports Podcast. And with us today we have uh, what we can easily call Meritzburg's power couple when it comes to extreme sports. We have Martin Dreyer and his lovely wife Jeannie. And if you don't know who they are, then uh, there's probably very little you know about extreme sports, but uh, or other words, adventure sports. Uh, a nickname for them could easily be the unlimited or limitless couple because these people clearly have no boundaries when it uh, comes to sport and adventure events because they do anything and everything and they don't give up. So welcome to uh, Martin and Jeannie. And let's start off by saying, uh, how did uh, the doozy go for you guys? Well, yeah, a big hello from us. The recent doozy was, it was a blast. I mean... I've said to my friends that my litmus test for a successful doozy if we still happily married afterwards, and we were. Plus, we had no swims. So, yeah, it was it was a great success. Um, I must say my wife allows me to be in control of the situation, being the senior partner. Um, but then when we cross over to other sports, then yeah, I tend to take a back seat. And Jeannie, tell us what no swims means for those who are not really paddling fans. Uh, well, just on um, for Martin's friends and the paddlers, it just means Martin's got his eye in after his 10 years of not paddling on the river. Um, for me and for novices, not to have any swims is the greatest of pleasures. It's always panicky when you're in a boat and you have that n- notion that you're going to fall out and swim. It's not, it's not actually falling into the water that's a problem. It's just uh, getting your boat to the side and getting back into the boat, emptying it of the water and that. It's quite, I mean, it's, it's fairly not getting tricky bashed on the up. When you go, when you swim... It's all in a rapid where there's rocks and it's yes, unpleasant. Yes. You're bumping your way down, you get cut and bruised and yeah, and the adrenaline dumps into the bloodstream and you can damage your boat and you lose your water bottle. and So it's really cool <laughs> to not have any swims. So on that note, how was the, the Burma Road issue and how did you tackle the, the rapids uh, in that area? No, well, for us, not having Burma uh, didn't play to our advantage because I'd say that is our strength. I'm not a paddler as such. 
And so we were kind of hoping that you know we'd have that little bit of leeway, the Burma Road run. Um, not having it on the third day, well, it is actually quite exciting. The 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 paddling around the Burma Road is is absolutely wonderful, especially this year. There was great water. I don't know any better. Actually, it could have been anything, and it would have been wonderful. <laughs> it's remote. It's beautiful. It's um yeah. It's just such a spectacular piece of geography between Marisburg and Durban. Like you, you don't get to paddle rivers through through and between um, cities in places. So yeah, it was a real novelty to paddle most of the way. And Martin, again, your people from the Change Your Life Academy acquitted themselves quite well. Kumbalani and Zimande, a 24-year-old uh, in particular. Tell us a little bit about him and what you saw from him during the Doozy Canoe Marathon a uh, fortnight ago. Yeah, Kumbalani is a, I mean, he's an exceptional talent and he's a rural youngster that, has, yeah, that comes from a pretty impoverished background. Um, he's been in the academy for many, many years, and last year he showed his cards by placing fourth in the singles doozy, fourth overall. And by that, he got invited by Andy Burker to become a doozy legend and having won his 10th won his doozy this year with Kumbalani. And so Andy asked him to race for the doozy, and yeah, the rest is history. I mean, they had a wonderful win. We were put under pressure by Tulani and Sibonele. It was exciting racing. But he's a doozy champion now. And I said to him, well, you can only be a dark horse once. Now he's a marked man. Going into the next doozy, he's, he's going to be watched closely. But it's, it's going to yeah, set him up for life, so to speak, in that from now the, the road is paved um, for him to make it his own. Um, he's a great lighty, a great individual, and he's, um, I think his future is bright. So you obviously foresee him going higher than fourth in next year's K1? I think, example. yes. I mean, uh, he's learned so much from Andy Burkett. Yeah. And he's like, uh, yeah, instilled on him uh, all his sort of blueprint to win. Okay. And because they were 50% each in that boat that won the doozy, you, you can't be 60 40 in a okay. K2 because you've got to pull your own weight. And Andy has plans to paddle further with Kumbulani, which is phenomenal because. Yeah, he's a world champion flatwater marathon paddler. And now to have that platform opened up to him, um, yeah, the sky's the limit. But Andy obviously is Mr. Doozy at the moment. But if you take uh, the Doozy Canoe Marathon, the full marathon uh, over three days, as well as the non-stop Doozy, which I believe you two are going to do uh, on Friday, then uh, Mr. Dreher has got quite a record. Of of winning in both, uh, unlike many other paddlers. So tell us about the strength required to do that, and and then Jeannie, if you will, I mean, is this man crazy? Uh. <laughs> is this man crazy? Um, I'll have to give it to Mart. He's a phenomenal athlete, and uh, he always claims that he's he's not the best paddler, which shows that he's not he's not a world marathon paddler. But um, combining the two, I would say, with his running and his paddling and it shows in the doozy and the non-stop he's by far the best being non-stop and in one day that's just up Mart's alley I mean more so than the the three-day doozy just because Mart knows how to grovel um <laughs> and he he's determined and yeah it's a I think it's a wonderful showcase of who Mart really is um I think yeah well thanks for that my honey <laughs> 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 but um the true doozy king is and we all will agree, Grandpa Bellis, 15 wins and 47 consecutive doozies and only one, one of those out of the top 50. So he's the doozy king. Annie Burkett is the doozy legend. I mean, he's still young and he could quite easily surpass Grandpa Bellis's record, so to speak. And he's just an all-around nice guy. It couldn't be, it couldn't be a, to a better person to have that the doozy mantle getting passed where greatness is going to come. Um, as far as myself goes, I'm a, I was a late starter. Started paddling when I was 29 only, and that's what Andy's just just over that now, and he's got 10 wins. I mean, I started very late, and then managed to get uh, a few wins. And the non-stop yes, I love it because it's got the endurance side, and it never seemed that difficult. But that was 10 years ago when I last raced it, <laughs> and I was a lot younger. Now I'm plus 50. And I've got fragile cargo, or the hardcore fragile cargo fragile in the back. Fragile cargo meaning? <laughs> <laughs> so 
um, we're gonna go and we're gonna go and have fun in this nonstop. Okay. And with the rain that's recently happened, I mean, we all smiles. Um, but we we can't be too broken when we cross that finish line. We'll, um, we haven't crossed it yet, but because the next day we fly down to go and ride the Absa Cape Epic, which is the world's Tour de France of mountain biking, and it's um, equally tough. So yeah, it's, it's it's not actually that difficult for us to do all this in that it's a lifestyle. We we maintain our fitness. We have a skill set to be able to do many things, and we don't put pressure on ourselves. It's the enjoyment factor has to be there. And so we were able to, to tick all the boxes. Uh, Jeannie, we understand you the boss when it comes to the bike mm. uh, as opposed to the kayak or road running or whatever. So tell us what's been your most memorable experience on the bike to date. And then secondly, what are you expecting at the Cape Epic this year? When you say most memorable, I'm sure my husband's saying, oh, it's got to be one that includes me. <laughs> um, <laughs> but I'd have to say it is we three years ago we um, I said to Mark Cheech I'd love to hike up Killy he had had the experience in 2000 um, and it just gives you a, a picture into what it's like on the mo- on a mountain and so he decided well maybe we need to make it a little bit more challenging let's take our bikes to the top and ride down it had been done in the past by a friend of his from America, they were doing some bike testing, and so everything was quite well executed and um, quite scientific. Whereas us palookas or plonkers <laughs> came along, and it was just a matter of taking our everyday bikes up there and riding them down. And yeah, it was one joyous experience. The, I loved the the mountain feel, and taking our bikes with us—they're a big part of our life. We've done many adventures on them together across the Rockies in the States, and that. So, yeah, it was a wonderful experience. Yeah, it really truly was because it's a high-altitude mountain, so you've got to be careful of altitude sickness. And a lot of people die in Kelly, actually, because it's non-technical, so it's easy to get up. But the high mountain being 5,800 meters plus, um, you've got to be careful of altitude sickness. And so we took four days getting up, as you should, to climatize. And then when we got to the top for that money shot, sunrise, perfect weather uh, photo at the top of the mountain, and then we said, well, okay, let's go. And four hours later, we were at the very bottom. It took us four days to go up. And so there was a reason for mountain bikes on Kili, <laughs> even though it was a big slog pushing them up to get them to the top. And and tell us, what, what are you expecting at the Cape Epic uh, as from Sunday, is it? Yes. As from Sunday. Um, we have no expectations. I'm the boss, and we are absolutely going to go there just to enjoy the experience. It's a world-renowned race. So generally, the best mountain biking you can you can do. Not often you get to do it, and so yeah, we're just going there to really enjoy the the comforts of the race itself. Yeah, to smell the roses. And what about coronavirus, uh, Martin? Are you not? Well, uh, yeah, we fortunately scared of that. Or what yeah, have the organisers <laughs> said to you entrants so far? So far, I mean, yeah, we haven't heard no. that no. the race isn't going to happen. It's this coronavirus is sort of happening as we speak in terms of like th- we just heard today the numbers almost doubled um so it's you know it's, it's all new um the epic's still in a quite a few more days um so we're not unsure about what's going to happen then but we have plans to go down and uh, we're very fortunate with our sponsorship for the race from team land rover that we're going to be treated really well with the other celebrities who are in team land Rover, like gary kirsten and carl brown the blitz Boker, ex-captain and Gary being a hugely successful protest cricketer. We stay in B&Bs, we have massages, we have bike mechanics, and yeah, we just, we're going to get treated, we're going to get pampered. So it's almost like <laughs> a, a holiday for okay. us. Run the bike, oh, what a treat. Um, and I say we have no expectations because it hasn't been our focus, but um, we don't want to miss it for the world. As far as the coronavirus, well, we'll take it as it comes. Um, suppose if you're a healthy individual, that you have nothing to fear, but... And that's all hearsay. And uh, Jeannie, we heard that you <laughs> went all around Mauritius and Rodriguez Island uh, last year, unsupported, uh, as part of your training for Doozy. Uh, tell us a bit about that as well, and that you had the children with you as well. 
Sure, nice to hear that that's the kind of training we get to do before an event. And Dreda's was a training camp. <laughs> but uh, yeah, that's high expectations for the next the next event we have to train for. But um, oh, we had a wonderful time. We had entered a team to go and do the adventure race in Rodrigues. Um, and seeing we were, had a, a stopover in Mauritius, we thought, well, what a wonderful opportunity to paddle around the island with our kids um, and support it. So as glamorous as Mauritius can be, um, it wasn't as glam, but it was still uh, the most amazing family experience. Um, just the quality time together, the basicness of it, you suddenly realize you need very little to survive. Um, and yeah, it was a magical 12 days of negotiating the island. Very safe environment within the reef. Yeah, and we had an absolutely uh, spectacular How time. How did you keep the children safe? If you don't mind me asking. The children? Uh. Got a, they got <laughs> weird life jackets. Um, it's a safe environment. As Jeannie said, the temperature doesn't vary from 23 to 27 degrees. And you're on these remote beaches. Three nights we slept on islands off the mainland. And the children, well, they're entertained by just all the sea life. Like when you paddling along and you, there's a reef and jump off, snorkel, get to the beaches. We did our CSI community work, so to speak, walking around the island collecting plastic. <laughs> um, so you know, the kids are just entertained because it's just out the outdoors. And there was just things, situations happening, like silly dolphins would pop up next to us. Or um, you're on the beach and there's a calamari, a big squid that's just washed up, but it's still alive and it's changing colour with all the dots flashing and like you pick it up and... Uh, the bird life, um, yeah, just you, you, you had one with nature. Sounds and like it was a real, real experience. Yeah, huh? just the basics. Like we used one pot to cook pasta in. We threw tuna in, pesto. We all ate from the same pot. Um, we just it was kept very basic because everything's on your kayak and you need to be self sufficient. Um, it was yeah a remarkable experience. And uh, Martin, in this day and age of technology, tell us a bit about the expenses involved in kayaking today versus uh, mountain biking yeah with kayaking we i mean we've loved our two weeks two months three months of working up towards the doozy canoe marathon with the paddle running training and your know, running is just a pair of running shoes and uh, the paddling is your once-off expense and there's no maintenance on your boat unless you break it going down a river Biking is a lot more expensive. I mean, it's there's working, moving parts in the bike that need con constant maintenance. Um, so it's, it is a lot more expensive. And when there's, and I hate to say it on a public broadcast, but like when there's bad weather, because I always preach to my mates, there's no such thing as bad weather. You've got to get out there because it's just soft people. Like there's, you can dress for the weather. <laughs> but when there's bad weather and just to conserve the bike, we just sit on the spinning bike and spin on, on our veranda and mm -hmm. rather than because mud and rain and stuff on a bike just kills your components where you like reduces the lifespan by a, a third so um yeah we did a bit of uh, spinning for our bike training but um definitely the paddling running is much more economical a sport to do than the the mountain biking and then um if you don't mind us ask how did you actually develop this like no boundaries, no fear kind of men mentality that has taken you, I think, to a lot of places and that included you winning the old camel trophy back in, back in the day, which was quite a mm. grueling thing. I mean, were your parents kind of uh, <laughs> influential I in that respect or did you just one day say... Oh, I think I'll just go and conquer the world. No, well, my parents, there must have been some input there with some genes, I'm sure. Um, whether they were switched on or off yet when I was <laughs> born, I'm not sure. But they were there. But I really think my tenacity for being able to suffer, so to speak, or just take on challenges uh, was my experience when I left South Africa in the early 90s when I, you, you had to do your army your national service was compulsory as a white, young white man. And I left the country to avoid that and ended up on the west coast of Canada. And I worked on a commercial fishing boat. And it ended up being a six-year stint. And I only came back to South Africa when I was 29. I left when I was 23 after having studied at UCT. I think there my DNA for adversity was rewired because it was 18-hour workdays on the boat, six hours sleep, 12 days at sea, 
and then one day to unload, get groceries, refill, and have that shower once every 12 days, and back to sea for a 12-day trip, eight and hour work day. And you had three months off a year, but you did that for nine months. And so I think that's where I learned about adversity and being able to conquer one's own sort of challenges because you had no choice. You're on this boat and you, you had to perform a certain role. And so then coming back and racing the doozy and then when I was 29 and making adventure my life till I was 40 seemed quite normal and always pushing myself seemed normal. And then meeting Jeannie towards my uh, racing career towards the end of it when I won my last doozy with Jelani Banjo in 2008, Jeannie had the same perspective and DNA wanting to push herself and yeah not that she had to be rewired but uh, she hadn't experienced as much as I had in terms of my working life and so she just slotted into the same ambitions that I had for adventure and thus talking about doing 900 kilometers unsupported across the Rockies with our bikes or up Kelly or around Mauritius Jeannie was able to just slot in so easily because I think we made we the same thread from the same cloth um, in terms of her ability to um, endure adversity. And had you always known that you were going to partake in sports events and adventure events on your return to South Africa, or did it just happen like that when, just when you got back from it Canada? It so happened in that when I came back from Canada, I wanted to paddle and I... My, f- my friends were paddling and the doozy was the big thing to do in South Africa. And I, and I knew I had a strong running background. I ran provincially at school, 1,500 metres. So then coming back in April 98, um, Grandpa Bellis saw this youngster from overseas coming back and being a Cape Tonian, no one up here was going to help me with the doozy. And he took me under his wing and gave me his blueprint to win the race. He was in his 50s and he showed me what was necessary, the detail, attention to detail down the rapids, the portages, and the training and what was required to win. And so when I came back from fishing from 92 to 98, I commercial fish for nine months here in Canada. In April 98, when I came back six months later, I won the doozy in a K1 in 99, purely with Graham's input. And then from then on, I won it the next year in 2000. And then as a treat to myself, I had made some money from my fishing career. I sponsored myself and then started doing sport full time. And it blossomed into a career for the next 10 years until I was 40. And then... So what Jeannie. has happened to the BCom? I've, <laughs> I've learned one thing from our BCom in that there's a, a part of your income that you can add, psychological income. Y- even though you don't actually get paid physically, you get paid money. If you're happy in what you do, you can add a lot of money to your bottom line. And so I learned from BCom that <laughs> you can earn a lot if you're happy in your job psychologically. And then, yeah, then having met Jeannie at 40, well... It, it was time to slow down because she put a little seed where she said, don't I want a family? And I was, no, no, I still got this overseas race and I need to go here and do this and that. And she said, but don't you? I said, yes, I do, but, but I still need to do this and that. And then, but you, Mark, you fought your reading and the penny dropped and we started our family almost immediately, not even having got married um, because it just seemed like the right thing to do. And since then, I mean, I give her my full support because she still has, hasn't really reached her peak with her own abilities and has conquered so many things individually without my help, like the Munger, 1,000 kilometers unsupported, bike race from Bloemfontein to Cape Town holds the record. The Freedom Challenge, she holds the record. The 361 nonstop mountain bike race, 361 kilometers around Oatsring, winning women's champion holds the record. Um, so Jeannie in her own right has also um, created her own independence as an, uh, a top endurance athlete. And now we've slowed down a little bit and we're doing things for fun thus Dr- the Dreya Family Adventures a little Facebook page we've started and we're going to do Family Adventures for having done the Mauritius trip with the kids and straight after Epic we're going to go on a little vacation and school holidays and do the Nine Peaks Challenge what is that going to entail? that's to climb the nine highest peaks in the nine provinces of South Africa and so we'll start we'll drive up to Limpopo to do the Iron Crown then we'll drop down to Mpulanga to the Deberg go across to the northwest to Nootgedacht. Gauteng, we do Turinkop, and then we'll drop down to the Free State, where the three big ones are. The, in the Free State, Namakadi, you go up the Montessauces, up the chain ladders into the Drakensberg. The highest in southern Africa is Mafadi in KZN, which you'll do that, starting from the Injasuti campground. It's a 40-kilometer round trip, so that'll probably be three days on the mountain with the kids. Mm-hmm. Go to camp and take it easy, because they're little rubies, seven kilometers ten. 
And then Kwaduma in the Eastern Cape, very remote from mountain, 29 kilometer round trip hiking. And then we'll cross down to the North Northern Cape to Merge Point and do that it's near Krafenet. And then in the Western Cape, we'll finish off with the Sierra VX Port Peak, which is also quite a technical, not very long. It's about a seven and a half kilometer hike, but very rocky and bouldery. But we just can't wait. It's, it's so going to be such an exciting adventure like for us. you're going to be tackling the entire South African escarpment mm. with yeah. your family. Is that right? Yeah, it does. <laughs> I mean, the, the peaks are all in, in that, they're quite bunched. Like up in the northern South Africa, those ones in the Limpopo and the Berg And those and as well, yes. And the, yeah. the ones, the Free State, KZN and Eastern Cape are all along the, the Sutu border. Mm. And the one in the Mafadi in KZN, it's only 30 meters lower than the highest in Southern Africa, the one in Tabana in Lesotho. So, yeah, we, we can't wait. I mean, we're going to take it very slowly, be conservative, uh, make sure that the kids have a, a wonderful experience. But for us, we'll obviously have a lot of gear to carry, and that'll be the challenge, taking all the treats and the hot chocolate and all that. We, it's not a race. It's going to be a, an experience. So you're going to drive from point A to B yes. and then climb up? There's, a, there's an official the challenge, mountain. the Nine Peaks the Challenge. There's a website with the information. Right. And yeah, you need to be authentic. We'll have a spot tracker as well, tracking our progress, so that the guys who go want to verify that we've done it will be um, able to see exactly that we climb to the top of the mountain, and we come down and we drive to the next climb up to the top, and so on. That we have a breadcrumb trail to show that we have completed it. But um, so the kids are highly motivated. So again, how many? kilometers is the the whole challenge how many does it work out to it's um in total distance of hiking i think it's 100 160 140 to 160 kilometers of hiking and it's about three and a half thousand kilometers driving sure but yeah we'll probably drive a lot at night because your daytime is your hiking time and then you'll wait for christmas right (laughs) just (laughs) relax with the family (laughs) surely you you don't have another trip planned before Christmas and after the Nine Peaks Challenge? No, we, we have actually do, but I think oh. the uh, coronavirus oh, no. is going to stop us from... Oh, overseas. Yeah, okay. yeah, oh, yeah, right. yeah, yeah, yeah. But the, so this, we this won't this talk about that one at the moment. <laughs> the Australia <laughs> Family Adventures, <laughs> Nine Peaks, is we've been wanting to do it for a long time. But I mean, oh, yeah, I mean, I can't just drop everything. I mean, that's going to just be our holiday two-week break, but my Change Life Academy is very close to my heart and all my focus, and Jeannie helps me there, all my focus goes into running my academy where I've got a running team. And on Friday, it's this, this has been the most hectic week. On Friday, I have my my Merchants Change Life running team traveling to Gauteng to do a warrior race. I've got my FNB Change Life mountain bike team flying to the Cape Epic, eight guys on Friday. And I have my Change Life paddlers racing the nonstop doozy on Friday. So my whole team has been mobilized this Friday, and I'm racing the nonstop as well with Jeannie. I just don't have any Excellent. time in the day. Yeah. yeah, so this Nine Peaks Challenge is just going to be our time, quiet time, just to take a, a two-week break. And uh, finally, uh, Jeannie, w- when did your light bulb moment come that said to you, you know, I can push my body further than most females for a start and also <laughs> further than a lot of males? And was your family also involved in, in your sporting or adventure decisions um, at any stage? Well, my dad likes to think if they had bikes like we have now, he would have been as good or better than me, so he claims to have those genes. Um, I'd say the day I came back uh, from play school and I'd, I said to my mom, yes, mom, I want to race today. And she said, oh, wonderful. I said, well, I beat all the boys. And so maybe that was the start of, of all this. And thirdly, I think as well as I do with endurance events, there are a lot of unsung females out there that quietly get on with doing endurance events. Um, as I saw on the doozy, there are lots of girls taking it on, and it's it's grueling, it's hard, it's um, it's hard in the body. Uh, you've got a boat to carry, and and you don't hear of these girls. So no, I think I think I'm pretty ordinary. <laughs> I don't think most people <laughs> will agree with you, but uh, Martin and Jeannie, thanks for coming in today and telling us a bit about your adventures. And they certainly make some of us uh, not just feel lazy, but uh, unaccomplished. <laughs> and uh, 
We wish you everything of the best from the witness and we hope you enjoy non-stop doozy Cape Epic Nine Peaks Challenge whilst the rest of us just carry on with our normal lives. So thanks Thank again and good luck. Thank you. As I, sorry, as I said to my kids, you um you always have to try and be your best. You don't have to be your you don't have to be the best. The best is a bonus, but to try and be your best, like that's what counts. So whatever you do, just make it count. Yeah. And yeah. Thanks to the Natal Witness because yeah. you guys give our local events like massive colourful coverage. Yeah. And that helps a lot. As far as Jeans and I go though, you paint the picture of all these events and so on that we do. It's actually a lifestyle. Like it's not actually hard work. Um, we we do it because we love it. There's there's no effort required as such. Yes, there's physical effort, but not really. It's yeah, you know, it's just a lifestyle. So I think that's important. Uh, not to do these moments of like people take on a uh, an event or a race and then they train so hard for it and it's unnaturally hard training and it's not. It needs to be a softer training and more of a lifestyle approach that you can do it forever. Like when some of us are having a big T-bone <laughs> steak and a big plate of chips, that kind of lifestyle. <laughs> <laughs> no, they need to, yeah. <laughs> you need to balance. balance and everything in moderation. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks a lot. Again, good luck and everything of the best for the future. Thanks Thank so you very much. much. Thank you. Before we leave you, if you want to get your clubs or associations notice about an upcoming event read out on this show, then send an email to sports at witness.co.za. You can also send us more audio comments to 082-604-4196. Watch out for more podcasts in the coming weeks on our timeline produced by The Witness. You can also like our Facebook page to listen. Till next time. Ciao. Ciao.